talk about AI uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, so artificial intelligence. You hear a lot about what is artificial intelligence. Um, and there are millions of definitions of artificial intelligence. I'm here to tell you artificial intelligence is a marketing buzzword. Uh, it's nothing more than a fancy word that's used to describe a multitude of different types of programs that collectively fall under this umbrella of artificial intelligence. It's not intelligent, folks. <laughs> it's a program. Yes. It doesn't think. It doesn't feel. It doesn't have insights. It's a program. It's following what its creators told it to do. And if we could have next slide. There are a couple of different classifications that I think are important for us to think about from our position as professionals. You don't need to know about machine learning. Uh, is this a large language program? What is it? It doesn't matter. Okay, there are two categories that you should think about. Discriminative AI. And I love that term because it includes the concept of discrimination, which is evil, right? Um, and generative AI. Gener so what's the difference in these two? Most of the AI that we've used uh, to date and that you touch in programs like LexisNexis, uh, Westlaw, um, any number of things like that, even the facial recognition. How many of you all, when you checked into your flight, looked into a camera and were then passed on? Okay? That's AI. That's facial recognition. And AI is recognizing those faces. Where do you think they got those faces to know it's you? They bought them. Okay? There's a secondary market to buy this data and information and their subscribers and they're tracking us. They know, they know it's our face and they're letting you through. Um, discriminative AI is simply a program, and don't get me wrong, it's fantastic. It's a program that's capable of parsing lots and lots and lots of information. And it parses through it and it looks for patterns. It looks for specific things that it can relate in response to your query uh, and it compiles an answer for that. So when it's the facial recognition software, it's trying to match the face it now sees in the camera with a face that it knows in its database that's associated with your name. Now it's amazing to me that it can do all of this stuff, but you know, there's lots of things out there. You can buy, in the United States at least, uh, a program that when Edith dials me up, of course, she's, let's just pretend she's an American citizen and she lives in Vermont. Uh, it's going to tell me that I have a call from Edith in Vermont and she voted in the last uh, four presidential uh, elections and the primaries show that she's a registered Democrat or a Republican voter, and so on and so forth, before I even answer that telephone call. How's it doing that? It's parsing massive amounts of data. It's connecting different data streams and giving a, an almost instant answer that then is of value to whoever people that would subscribe to that would be marketing people, so they need it. But that's discriminative AI. It's not creating anything. It's going through the data that it has access to, and it's giving you the answer, hopefully, that you saw. Sometimes that answer isn't so great. Uh, generative AI. It's a little bit different. Generative AI has all the same mechanical processing that the, that the discriminative AI has in place but it creates something new from that. Um, so ChatGPT is the, is the famous one, right? Um, you, can, you can chat with, uh, with that, 
and it will write a document for you. It'll write a letter, it'll write a job description, it can write uh, any number of things that you might ask it to do. That's generative AI. Creates something new. Issues arise when you've got generative AI that's creating portraits. There's generative AI that creates software programs. How's it doing that? It's going through the data that it has access to and it is creating software programs based on what it's had access to. Well, there's all kinds of problems in that. Uh, next, next slide, if you would. Before we jump in and go down that rabbit hole, how are we using it? We've talked a little bit about it, but we've got client intake. And, and by the way, there's a lot of CPAs and accountants in here. I'm assuming you do the same thing as, as we in, in the sense of financial services, so you've got certainly client intake. Uh, E-discovery for us lawyers is taking, um, uh, trying to get all these electronic documents from our clients. Uh, emails, heaven forbid text messages now, they're the worst. Uh, although emails are awful because what do we do? We include the entire conversation in every single new email that we send, uh, which creates a nightmare for us lawyers on the end of the spec, doesn't it? How many duplicative documents do you have in your productions, right? AI has the ability of sorting through all of that garbage, getting down to the core essence and helping you quickly analyze things and figure out what documents are, are useful. Uh, expertise automation, that, that is, a, is a possibility. Legal research, LexisNexis, uh, et cetera. Document management. Your firms, my firm, we all have a lot of documents and it gets a little bit difficult. The great thing about documents, uh, certainly for lawyers, is they're wonderful form banks. Um, they're wonderful at helping us create and figure out new things uh, later. Uh, but accessing them efficiently is difficult. Making sure that you don't have conflicts of interest of your clients and things of that nature can be difficult. Managing the documents um, is key to uh, a successful practice. Document analytics helps you with your practice to improve things. It can help you make sure that your uh, new work product is accurate, uh, doesn't have glaring typographical errors in it, uh, doesn't have, heaven forbid, another client's name in it. Um, because you missed legacy, <laughs> legacy data. It's never happened, right, Edith? Um, never. Um, you know, so it can do a lot to help you do your job better. Document generation. This is a new area, uh, at least for lawyers. Uh, there's software out there now um, uh, that is coming down the pike that has the ability to have you give it a command and say, I want to negotiate this document aggressively in the following areas. And the software purports using chat GPT-4 uh, to be able to go out there, make proposals as to what you might try to negotiate uh, and redline the document so that you can see how that would look in the context of the document. So, you know, if it works, uh, that would be quite a, a time saver for, for a council and might address some staffing type issues that you encounter. Um, it, um, but it, it, it's, it's not there yet, it's coming. Uh, there's, there's a lot of effort working uh, on, on issues like that. Uh, it could also, for example, take a Tennessee agreement and uh, adapt it to California law. Um, you know, now whether it can do it cross-border or not, uh, I don't know. I imagine that first generation of these things are going to be limited to um, jurisdictional bundles. So maybe the EU uh, and the U.S. where they have multiple states available would be appropriate targets for them, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly where that's going to happen. 
And then you've got predictive analytics. Um, this is interesting. So a lawyer um, could take, have, if you had an AI program that has access to all of the federal cases that have ever been in the United States uh, since the electronic age, and trust me, they're all online and available. You can look at not just the decisions that have been made so that, that are binding law, but you can go and you can look at each motion that was filed by the parties and uh, the briefs that they filed in support of their motions, how the judge ruled on a given motion, all things that don't create immediate active law, um, and predict how your client's case is going to progress and give that client that heads up early on and it factors into the settlement process because 98% plus of lawsuits settle. Uh, sadly, they don't settle usually until the cost of legal services on both sides rises to a high enough level that the parties are uh, crying for relief and they, um, under, under distress, start negotiating uh, in, in seriousness with, with each other and cases come together. But predictive analysis uh, is possible. We'll see how active, how accurate it is, but if it is, at least to the extent it's, it's more like a Westlaw or a Lexus uh, and it's giving you outcomes, it could really help uh, manage uh, and predict where your cases are going to go. So next up, um, top reasons that clients are seeking legal advice. They want to know about compliance, okay, uh, with AI. And one of the big challenges with AI is that AI came along after the vast majority of our laws and our regulations were created. So guess what, when we wrote those laws and we wrote those regulations, we didn't have a clue how AI would upset that apple cart. And upset it, it has. So clients need to know that they're compliant. If they want to adopt an AI program that does the initial round of interviews, and they're, that's very popular in the United States to do a, an electronic interview, um, they need to know that, that AI, if you're using it to cull through the applicants, isn't discriminating against somebody on the basis of, of sex, uh, uh, religion, race, nationality, you name it, uh, any number of different factors. So that could be uh, an area in those uh, HR type programs where you're worried that there might be a built-in bias in, in the algorithm of that program. Uh, or you're worried that if it's a supervisory model of AI, uh, that the supervisors aren't inadvertently inserting their bias into the process. Um, or it could be a data set bias. The algorithm's fine, but guess what? You gave them data that um, maybe because of the industry that you're pulling from, or maybe because of the region that you're in, uh, and the particular demographics of that region, it gives you a result that's considered to be discriminatory in some manner. Uh, and it takes eyes to figure that out. So uh, the difference between your eyes <coughs> and the eyes of the supervisors of those, of those AI programs is that you all have an obligation to your client to give them the best result that is appropriate. So you're not gonna look at it in quite the same, same light. So how do you do that effectively, right? Um, this is all new. How do, we, how do we adapt to that? That's our challenge. We have to learn how to live with AI. It's a new tool, it's dynamic. It's got lots of potential benefits, but it has challenges for us as professional advisors so that we're staying up to date. And it's not that, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a 50 plus lawyer size lawyer firm, right? It's not that my firm can say, hey, Mark knows how to use AI, so I don't have to know how to use AI. That's, that's not the way it is. We all have to know how to use AI. We all need to understand these risks associated with AI 
or we're not keeping up with the obligations that we have in our professions. Um, so compliance, risk mitigation. Um, you know, they're, they're looking at trying to minimize their risks and they want to make sure uh, that in bringing in AI, there's not something there that's enhanced. They want to keep up with best practices because they want to be able to market their services and say, you know, that they're on top of their game. In order to do that, we've got to give them other inputs. They want to expand their business, uh, engage in strategic development, and they need advice on how this might help them in their, uh, in their venture. Um, dispute resolution uh, it can come into play there as well. So those are some uses. Um, the interesting thing is that the analysis for, analysis for our clients isn't any different than the analysis that we need to be going through ourselves when we bring in AI. So let's, let's go to the next slide. So these are some AI risks. We've got algor algorithmic errors, which we've, you've heard talked about several times today. Algorithmic bias and uh, value alignment and the oversight bias and the value alignments there are, are and by value alignment I mean are the is the program's values and intrinsic value aligned with your client's values, okay? Um, are you on that same page? And I, I, I love, absolutely love, the young programmers that come up with all these great new words that this old 65-year-old man have to, has to uh, learn. Uh, and one of them was hallucination. Did you know that AI can hallucinate? I mean, I know I could. Get, on, get me on the right drugs, I'll hallucinate all day long, but I'd never heard of a program hallucinating. I thought they just did what you were told to do, right? Well, hallucination is when they make stuff up. And it's happened. It happens. Uh, in the United States, there was a, uh, a lawyer who decided it would be really neat to, and quick to get... Chat GPT to write his brief for him. So he got Chat, T Chat GPT to write this brief. He filed it with the court. The other side did what they were supposed to do. They read his cases that he cited. And lo and behold, the cases were fake. He said, but your honor, I didn't know AI could lie. I thought it just gave me facts. So, you know, he didn't bother to research his own cases. So he, he dropped the ball, terrible lawyer. His job was to read those cases and make sure they applied and to properly present them to the, to the court in the manner that they stood for. He didn't bother to read them, and the AI made them up. Well, I didn't know AI could lie either until I started reading and found out some of these things. So be aware... It can tell you stuff that is completely and utterly false. So that's why it's important and why I don't think it's just going to take over for our, for our roles because there's nobody out there that can tell you when it's, when it's lying. Um, you know, mention, mention of that was, was made earlier. They're developing AI programs to police the AI programs. And I, and I suppose you have to do that if, if in order to discern some of this falsity, you've got to be, have that ability to parse all the same massive amounts of data um, to get there. But if we can't rely on the main program not to lie, how can we rely on the policeman not to lie? They all have that risk. And it's going to fall on our shoulders to figure out when that's happening. And that's, and that's a real challenge. And I'm not telling you I've got the answers to that. That's a real challenge for us. Um, hallucination. Data misappropriation. Now you're jumping into my world. Um, data misappropriation happens every day. In the traditional business environment, you own your data or you're licensing your data from somebody and for, forget, forget software. If I've got something of value and you want to use it in your business, you have to come to me and get my permission to use my data. Okay? You can't just go 
breaking in my office and grabbing my data and putting it to use. If you did that, you'd breach the law and you're going to get penalized for that in some manner. Well, business progressed and we started saving our, our information electronically. So it's in the cloud, right? Well, uh, you know, what cloud? It's in the ether up there, um, probably the Amazon web uh, and, uh, or one of the other major, major players. Um, can you see what they're doing with your data? Does anybody here have access to see what's happening in those databases? None of us do, right? If you were a criminal, where would you operate? Would you operate where people can see you, or would you operate where they can't? We're at the greatest risk when we have stuff in the hands of people that we don't even know, okay? We've got contracts that kind of outline those relationships. Well, I write those contracts. Guess what? If I'm representing Amazon, that contract's going to say, I, Amazon, have the right to use your data unless Amazon tells me that, it, Mark, we'd love to say this, but you know what? We can't sell our product if we tell people that we own their data uh, because no one will hire us. Um, you know, so we've got to soften that a little bit and we need to tell them that it's your data we're not going to use it uh, et cetera, et cetera, except you know for our internal business blah 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 right well how they interpret that language typically at least in america where a business's business records is their property they have the right to use it okay unless there are restrictions in there. Now, they can't go into competition with you. They probably make the argument that, uh, that when they train AI, um, that, that they're just making that AI smarter and it's helping. But guess who the buyers of that AI are? Your competition. Um, so does your client want their data to be in the, in the hands of a company that is making life easier for their competition? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off there to be made, uh, an analysis that, that one has to go through. Um, but if they use the data without permission, and I'm not talking about privacy law here, that's an overlap where the, where the law is imposing obligations on top of where property rights go. I'm talking about property rights. Uh, if they use someone else's property without permission, then, and they gained value because their AI gained a knowledge and therefore increased in its value in the world, then that accretion of value is attributable in part to the data that they misappropriated. And that person from whom it was misappropriated has a legal claim against the owner of the AI uh, of some amount. Exactly how you parse through that, I don't know, but guess what? Those lawsuits are ongoing right now in America. There's a huge one against GitHub and Microsoft and others over software, uh, the software generation program. And it's gonna wind around, it'll take years to go through. And until all these things go through, we really don't have precedential um, uh, authority to know exactly where the law is going to fall out. Um, but data misappropriation is huge because it's putting people at risk, particularly if you represent one of those AI owners or a SaaS service company that's using AI um, and uh, providing a service to others. You've got potential problems. Uh, the outcome attribution um, that's a problem for us. E Edith and I have talked about that quite a bit. Uh, they don't tell you what their sources were. They simply give you the result. Uh, you're starting to see a little bit of the source stuff coming up. ChatGPT will footnote its, its stuff and, and give you places to go look. Um, regulatory compliance challenges, we kind of talked about that. So let's, let's go to the next slide, if you will. So risk analysis. What are the processes? And again, it, it, this is kind of the same for us as it is for us in doing it for our clients. You know, you wanna, you wanna understand the data sources. And 
how are they handling it? So when, when you are using this AI, you don't want to get yourself in trouble and be complicit. So you need to understand what their processes are. It doesn't have to be a lengthy conversation, but you need to have some feel for it. Outcome analysis. Uh, do you feel comfortable with the outcomes that you're getting? And this should be an ongoing thing, right? It's, this isn't a one-time deal. This is always being vigilant and alert and looking for uh, possible problems. But again, if you're dealing with an employment issue, you don't want to put your untrained secretarial assistant in charge of running the AI program and managing the results of it and passing it on because that person isn't trained to be able to recognize bias, compliance with the law, etc. Uh, it is not a viable solution for someone at that level to use. You need to be involved, you need to be alert to these issues. Uh, yes, it saves us time, it's great, it may cut down on some staffing costs, but it's got to cut, be used at the right level in your organization or it's going to create all kinds of problems. And the same goes for our clients. Outcome ownership and usage rights, we kind of talked about that in the earlier one. Outcome IP assessment. What kind of IP is being generated by generative AI? In most of the world, the exception being the Asian countries, in order for AI to be, uh, AI's generated output uh, to be protected under patent law or under copyright law, there has to be a level of human involvement in steering that result. Um, or, you know, that's not going to be allowed to be registered as a patent or registered under copyright law. So where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with trade secrets, um, business, um, business information. And it's a much more fragile type of intellectual property. Uh, it requires being maintained in secret. Your client's business model may not accommodate that information being maintained in secret. So its, it's period of being secret may be very short. Uh, if, if they don't have the right model. Um, it's, it's one reason why a lot of software now, you see it as a SaaS model, because all that data gets to stay behind the curtain, uh, and all the client sees, the customer sees, as the dashboard on the website on what information they need to interface with, uh, with that data set. So it's a convenient way to protect that, that asset, but you need to understand um, what's going on here because every piece of intellectual property is a means of protecting uh, the business of, of your customer and they're like uh, a Venn diagram, a bunch of concentric circles that overlap and they create a, a zone of various types of problems to a competitor that wants to encroach on that space. Um, and uh, it's very important for us to be able to identify for the client what that means. Um, it's also important to look at, from a risk assessment standpoint, um, what are the risks presented by this? Can I go to an insurance company and buy insurance coverages to protect against this risk? Almost all insurance has deductibles. We're used to that, right? So a deductible means that you're going to be self-insured for that portion of that risk, and the carrier covers the rest of it. Well, oftentimes um, we try to shift that burden of paying for that insurance, shift the burden for an indemnity to the service provider. Very difficult when you're dealing with a Google or an Amazon to say to them as a little bitty company that uh, you're expecting them to indemnify you from everything that flows, it's not going to happen. Um, so, you, you know, you're going to be talking about your insurance carrier and what they're able to cover, uh, and you're probably going to have some res residual risk. Your clients are probably going to have residual risks. What is that cost-benefit analysis there? We're not responsible for that for our clients, right? Because we're supposed to be making 
well, your accountants do more of this, but we lawyers uh, are supposed to refine, re, you know, to, to uh, keep our advice limited to legal advice and not give business advice. That's the realm of the businessman. You accountants in the consulting space are giving advice to your clients to help them with that business decision. And you need to be more focused on this cost benefit. You know, how does it play out? Um, and ultimately, cost benefit analysis on something like this flows through to ensuring that your client is pricing their products or their services high enough to take into account these, uh, these various new factors that are being laid, layered on there uh, for consideration. If y'all aren't doing that, then your clients aren't going to be in business very long because they're going to get hit with an unexpected expense and it's going to blow up their model. Uh, so it's, it's really important to, uh, to make sure that this is tracked. It doesn't just stop with us lawyers. It goes on through to you accountants and on with the clients in order to make effective decisions.